it is interesting to, 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 to how management can really, really influence the way soil is made, soil health is formed, and soil health is encouraged, regenerated, if you will. And, um, you know, we're, we're continuing to, to learn how to take it to the next level. You see, I, I have taken soil tests of my woods, which I'm assuming was close to where my fields were when this land was cleared roughly 200 years ago. So my goal was to get back to those uh, levels. If I could get back to the levels where my woods is currently, uh, that would be really cool. So that's 11% in the top two inches, about 8% in the, in the um, uh, two, to, two to four inches, and then it goes down from there. So, you know, looking at those increments there is, is the level I have. Now, I'm not there yet, but um, we're getting closer. So that's a goal that may not, may not be achieved in my lifetime, but we're trying. And would you say it's the cover crops specifically that are leading to the regeneration? What are kind of your main like drivers of that? So it's cover crops, uh, which are able to take uh, CO2 and turn it into carbon, which is organic matter, uh, putting into the soil. And then it's by not disturbing the soil. A lot of people don't realize when you disturb the soil with tillage, uh, the carbon that's in the soil uh, mixes with the air and it becomes CO2 and escapes. So that's organic matter. So you burn up organic matter whenever you till. Uh, so those of you who are tilling out there, you may feel guilty the next time that you're tilling the soil because you're essentially creating a burst of CO2 in the atmosphere and you're hurting your uh, organic matter levels. Now, if you, you know, add manure, you add other amendments to your soil, you can negate that. But then you're bringing in something from somewhere. So it's not, is it really a net gain or not? You can, or you can raise your organic matter levels in your fields. You don't have to bring on things. You just have to collect the CO2 that your plants can do. Plants do that. That's the way the earth was designed to function. That puts it into the ground and you don't disturb the soil. You'll keep it there. Your organic matter increase. It's very simple. It's very simple to understand. It's not complex. And I'm here to tell you, it works. And welcome. I am so excited because we are joined here today by Steve Groff. Steve, if you want to just go ahead and take us right into us, tell us a little bit about your farm. Was it always regenerative or is it something you grew into? We want to hear all the story. Okay, well, let's sit back and enjoy the next three hours. <laughs> I could do it a lot quicker than that. No, I'm a third generation farmer, southeastern Pennsylvania, Lancaster County to be exact. And I'm living actually in the house that, uh, or the farm that my grandparents bought in 1935. Uh, my father bought the neighboring farm, which adjoins this farm. And so that's actually where I grew up. Now I'm back here. And now my son is uh, also uh, living and working here full time. And they just had a son. So we might have the fifth generation here lined up. Um, so it's been been a while. We kind of got a little bit of a legacy, I guess you'd say, going on here. And, and it's really interesting when you think back about the soil, and that's really what we're talking about here. And and you know, how my grandfather farmed. I was able to see aerial images, aerial images of the farm, and it certainly looks quite different now. The fields are laid out totally different, and we have waterways uh, in, in and of course what you can't see in the picture, but now it's 100 percent no-till since 1995. And we use intensively use cover crops. I started no trail back in 1982 because I had ditches or soil erosion so bad, in fact, that we couldn't even go across some of them with a the tractor when we wanted to harvest our crops. So in 1982, ditches were just, frankly, they were just annoying. I had no concept, you know, about soil health or anything. Frankly, it didn't, it didn't even enter my mind. It was just those annoying pesky ditches. And um, so we didn't till the soil. And those same fields, the first two fields that we started in 1982 have not been touched by tillage now for 40 years. The organic matter has nearly tripled in those fields. 
and you can literally see the top inch and a half or so is pure soil. Uh, we have uh, stony fields here, stony topsoil, so it's very vivid when you take a shovel and look at it. And uh, especially if you go into a neighboring farm, which is, there's a few of them around you that still till, and you can see all the little stones and gravel and stuff on top. You don't see that in these long-term fields. So then it was in the mid nineties or like, I really got into cover crops, did research with University of Maryland, Penn State, USDA, Rodeo Institute, uh, anybody who would uh, want to uh, work with me here. And, and I learned a lot by cooperating with, with those folks. And also I might add other farmers, uh, other farmers who are like-minded and so forth. So here we are 25 years uh, later, uh, in uh, 2022, still learning, still progressing, but my farm is basically uh, founded on the, re on the principles of regenerative agriculture, uh, you know, living roots in the soil, soil is covered, low soil, no soil disturbance, uh, diversity, plants uh, and roots growing year round. And uh, so, so all those things, all those dynamics are in place and we continue to learn. Uh, one of the new things that we've done in the last couple of years is starting to grow hemp. And so we have CBD hemp, uh, our own brand now at cedarmeadow.farm, where we uh, are able to promote regenerative ag grown CBD products. So that's kind of a, a fun project in the marketing side. So that's a little bit of an opening of uh, a lot that I'm involved with, but um, you know, we, we have a lot more details we can discuss. Yeah, well, so take me kind of through your upper level. So what were your products? So hemp is new, what was your farm producing over the years? Um, you know, were you selling direct to consumer? Kind of give us a little bit about, you know, more on that. Yeah, so we've been growing vegetables all my life, even back to my grandfather, uh, particularly tomatoes. And I expanded that when I graduated from high school in the early 80s. And now uh, we continue to grow heirloom tomatoes now. We've kind of shifted to those. We grow squash and pumpkins and gourds and all kinds of decorative things for the fall. And I grow some small grains like black oats in particular that we sell as a cover crop, cover crop seed to other farmers. I grow a little bit of corn, mainly it's for my Amish neighbors, uh, silage corn. Uh, we grow that to, for, for them to uh, feed their cows. Um, and that's pretty much rounds out uh, what we do uh, here. So it's, it's fairly diverse. We really try to keep things uh, rotated as a big, um, you know, factor of how regenerative agriculture works. And uh, of course, it goes without saying that all the fields are planted in cover crops. Uh, even if I get late till Thanksgiving, we're, we're, if there's delayed harvest for whatever reason, we are planting a cover crop. Uh, every acre of the farm gets a cover crop every year. And that's been going on for years. So, uh, so that's a high value that we have. So how did you make those tough choices about which are the right things to grow? You said it used to be one type of tomato, you went heirloom and definitely that black oat, like what's special about that? Kind of just how did you start making those choices? Was that based on retail, like where, where what led you there? Yeah, well, I did fail to wrap up uh, the, the previous question. Uh, almost all our pr products that we grow here are sold wholesale. Uh, so we don't do direct marketing. I'm, in, I'm not in a very good location around here as far as, you know, good location road wise. And, and um, you know, we don't have a lot of population around the farm here to supply retail. Um, so we switched from the, I'll call it the normal round, uh, round red fresh market tomatoes that you would buy in a store to heirloom. And that mainly was because of taste, they taste better. And because I got into growing them in high tunnels, heirloom tomatoes are rather fickle outside because you get a heavy rainstorm and they're pretty much unmarketable for a week or two. Uh, they're just not able to withstand heavy rains and so forth. So by having them in high tunnels grown in soil, I might add, we are able to uh, grow a very beautiful, consistent grade of heirloom tomatoes. So we plant about 20 to 25 varieties a year and um, might be surprised to learn that we try not to grow red ones. Huh. Everything got red. <laughs> it's going to be different and unique. And so we have a, a rainbow color, a ra uh, shape sizes, and nuances of flavor, but they all need to taste good. So uh, that's a market that we, I guess you call it a niche market that we got into. So we make this really nice mix of tomatoes that goes out in single layer trays, and they really look pretty uh, when you arrange them, the shapes and the size and colors. 
um, and do, you know, we try to have at least six different varieties in every tray if tomato is, it leaves a farm. Uh, the other thing too, I might add kind of on a similar note, growing uh, some of the odd heirloom type or ornamental pumpkins and squash. This year, I, uh, I'm in a process right now, literally I just came in from the field to plant, we're planting over 100 varieties of all kinds of uh, pumpkins and squash and gourds. So as soon as I'm done with this, I'm going right back out to continue <laughs> planting. Uh, so, so that's another dynamic that we do uh, in, in our diversity of our crops that we grow. Did you work with a wholesaler who wanted these things or how did that, because of course, like that's a very unique product, no red tomatoes, uh, ornamental gourds. Like, is it something they came to you and asked you or you loved them and you had to go sell them? <laughs> Um, it kind of works both ways. Uh, once you're in the business for a while, you get a reputation. And there have been some buyers that I have been with for many years, decades, matter of fact. And so, yeah, we talk about what are they looking for? What are they needed, uh, needing and so forth. And so sometimes I'll grow what they asked me to grow if I wasn't aware of it. Uh, the other times I'll say, hey, here's something cool. You want to try it? And, and we go from there. Uh, so Depending on, depending on a wholesale or some of them want to stick to a few main, more popular varieties, others want as many in the mix as possible. So it's all about knowing your customer. And for my case, it's the wholesale buyers and uh, understanding what they need and then growing uh, for them. So pretty much before I put a seed in the ground, most all my uh, products are already uh, have an agreement and selling them. So that's how that kind of works in the produce business. It's a pretty good way to sell things is making sure you have someone to buy them, right? Especially yep. with the shelf life. <laughs> so you mentioned it all started with these ditches. So can mm -hmm. you tell me a little bit about like how your farm has transformed through this? Like, obviously, I hope the ditches are gone. And <laughs> what kind of other benefits have you seen in this huge transformation from you no know, consciousness of soil health to now having, you know, arguably some of the best soil in the rocky area of Pennsylvania? <laughs> yeah. Oh, I challenge people to come to the farm and go look for those ditches, see if you can find them. <laughs> um, now, that being said, you know, you can kind of gauge maybe where they would have been because of the natural lay of the land and everything, but uh, they're not there. Um, and they haven't been there for a while. Um, matter of fact, I did a video here a couple of years ago of cutting hay at like six, seven mile an hour right through where there's uh, areas used to be to try to make a point that, you know, you, you wouldn't even know it uh, where they were. So. Uh, it is interesting to, 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 to how management can really, really influence the way soil is made, soil health is formed, and soil health is encouraged, regenerated, if you will. And, um, you know, we're, we're continuing to, to learn how to take it to the next level. You see, I, I have taken soil tests of my woods, which I'm assuming was close to where my fields were when this land was cleared roughly 200 years ago. So my goal was to get back to those uh, levels. If I could get back to the levels where my woods is currently, uh, that would be really cool. So that's 11% in the top two inches, about 8% in the, in the um, uh, two, to, two to four inches, and then it goes down from there. So, you know, looking at those increments there is, is the level I have. Now, I'm not there yet, but um, we're getting closer. So that's a goal that may not, may not be achieved in my lifetime, but we're trying. And would you say it's the cover crops specifically that are leading to the regeneration? What are kind of your main, like, drivers of that? So it's cover crops, uh, which are able to take uh, CO2 and turn it into carbon, which is organic matter, uh, putting it into the soil, and then... It's by not disturbing the soil. A lot of people don't realize when you disturb the soil with tillage, uh, the carbon that's in the soil uh, mixes with the air and it becomes CO2 and escapes. So that's organic matter. So you burn up organic matter whenever you till. Uh, so those of you who are tilling out there, you may feel guilty the next time that you're tilling the soil because you're essentially creating a burst of CO2 in the atmosphere and you're hurting your uh, organic matter levels. Now, if you, you know, add manure, you add other amendments to your soil, you can negate that. But then you're bringing in something from somewhere. So it's not, is it really a net gain or not? You can, or you can raise your organic matter levels in your fields. You don't have to bring on things. You just have to collect 
the CO2 that your plants can do. Plants do that. That's the way the earth was designed to function. That puts it into the ground and you don't disturb the soil, you'll keep it there, your organic matter increase. It's very simple. It's very simple to understand. It's not complex. And I'm here to tell you it works. I love it. Um, since you have a bit of a unique buyer as the wholesaler, have you found that they have any interest in your farming practices or are they just like at the end of the day, you provided what we asked for and what we bought, but we are finding, of course, consumers are shifting towards regenerative. Are you finding that in your markets as well? Well, that's a very good question because um, it's all over the map. There are some buyers who really care and that's how I've got my markets. Um, those who don't care, I might add, are slowly slipping away because if I don't really need them, I am moving to the people who want my story. They want what I do. And uh, I'm not going to name names here, uh, but there's some, some major buyers that people will be surprised maybe on both sides of that coin. Um, you know, based on what they say and then what they actually do. Uh, so uh, I'm working with the ones who appreciate what I do and they're genuinely interested in it. It's kind of a collective um, group, if you will, in shared goals and values. And because their customers generally share those values as well. So I've had several companies, big name national companies, they, they send representatives to my farm not so much to just like investigate what I'm doing to see if I say what's true, well, that's part of it, but also so that they can observe and learn and then they can tell my story to their customers directly. And those are the best ones uh, that we meet with face-to-face. -face. We have a relationship and they get it. I have been contacted by one in particular um, that because of what I was doing, they wanted my uh, products. So. Uh, so that's just an example there uh, to, to your point of your question is, yes, as the years tick away here, more and more of the larger buyers, or maybe smaller ones, but more and more people, I should say, are interested in this type of farming. I love it. And so, of course, like with converting people to understanding why this is so much better, there's a consumer education struggle, of course. And spoiler mm -hmm. alert, I'm going to talk a little bit about your book that, of course, okay. empowers other people to do it. But I was literally so looking around here for my book to show it to you. <laughs> I'll have to layer it over. <laughs> right back. Uh, you mentioned about my book. So, yeah, I wrote a book, The Future Proof Farm, uh, Changing Mindsets in a Changing World. And that's really... I kind of jokingly say, but as you eat, you would appreciate reading this book because this is not a how to farm book. This is where agriculture is headed, uh, where I see it's headed. And uh, you know, you heard my story where I've been, uh, but I've been all over the world as well, sharing what I've learned. And that's how I look at it, sharing and educating um, in, in a way, I guess you could say I'm a teacher to farmers, uh, to how to do this system but also not just to farmers, to the buyers, uh, the, those who are buying food, whatever it may be. And I have lots and lots of stories in the book about some of the names, uh, the name brands that people are very familiar with uh, that I've worked with in the past. Uh, Blue Apron would be one internet meal service company, Whole Foods, uh, Sweet Green is a smaller one in the East Coast here. And I mentioned some of these stories that they, where they really appreciate regenerative agriculture methods and, and how that passes that story on, they pass that story on to their customers. So um, that's really what the book is about, some of my stories. So, con so consumers uh, can learn and, and find out there actually are farmers out there who are trying to grow food in a way that's not only responsible in the context of the planet, but also more nutritionally dense or nutrient dense, as we say, better food. Because when you grow food in a regenerative way, it's gonna be better for you. There's gonna be more nutrients in there. And then we start talking about healthcare and, and, and all that, which, you know, that affects everyone. And we all know that our diet, uh, to, to some degree, you are what you eat, uh, but, you know, how can you, you know, maximize that? You wanna eat a tomato that is fortified with nutrients and vitamins naturally. And um, I, I like to say as an example that almost all the multivitamin or the vitamin companies, the health 
the health companies that sell pills and stuff, they all say farmers don't put in nutrition like they used to, or it's mined out of the soil. And there's truth to that. And it's not really the farmer's fault though, because farmers don't get paid for that. Farmers get paid for yield. They don't get paid for high selenium or zinc or a manganese or all those minerals, uh, calcium, you know, that we talk about. They get paid for yield, for the quantity and the quality. And not all of those nutrients are necessary for yield. So because of that, uh, farmers have not been paying attention to that. But uh, there's a lot of those type of nutrients actually in the soil, but they're locked up because the soil is not alive. When we make the soil alive by regenerating it, get the biological activity in it, those nutrients then are beginning to release and they are taken up by the roots and they're in that tomato or that butternut squash that you eat. So that's what I'm talking about in the book. So that's why I say, if you eat, the book is for you. So basically it is for everyone. I, I think that's amazing though, because we have so many conversations about how an apple grown in the eighties to an apple grown today is completely different nutritional panel. And it's because the soil has been depleted. We can argue why and all the reasons, but what we know is that we are nutrient deficient and yeah. it, it's unfortunate to get our health from a pill when we could get it from nature instead. <laughs> I think everyone would agree to that. I know there's some inconvenience, uh, right. And, and, and right now, you know, how do you know? How do you know which farmers are genuine? Um, and I, again, thing, I'll just harken back to the book, which by the way, you can get it at stevegroff.com, uh, my website, stevegroff.com. Uh, and you can see a little bit of reviews and so forth. Um, but in that, in my book, I would talk about a nutrient density meter that is being worked on now uh, by the Bio Bionutrient Institute, where eventually, um, the hope is you'll be able to go up to that tomato or that apple, as you had said, in a grocery store and take a reading, you know, through your smartphone and be able to see what the nutrient density is. So you can actually shop for nutrition because uh, it doesn't matter so much what people say they do. It matters what there is in their end product. And if we can, if we can get that technology to be consistent in, in that, that's going to be a game changer in agriculture uh, because then I will say that you will be essentially forced to use regenerative methods to get that. And I don't say forth in the forced in the context of, you know, a government regulation, but if you want to be, well, maybe I'll put it this way, if you don't want to become obsolete as a farmer, you're going to have to do things that pack nutrition into the product that you grow. I do think when the nutrient meter comes out, it's about to be a very different awakening into yeah. quality of agriculture across the scale. So good to be mm -hmm. leading the movement, right? Good to be yeah. on the, the other side already. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned two things that I think are really neat that I want to kind of carve out a little bit. So of course you say that the wholesalers have come to you because they know your difference. Well, of course, like how do we get to people understanding that difference? And one of the big things you've done is educate and storytelling. Would you yeah. say that those have kind of been your marketing techniques for lack of like, obviously you're just doing it out of passion, but it is a, a marketing technique of a way to share what you're passionate about. How has that gone? How do you feel like, is that a, a method you suggest? <laughs> well, I'm still trying to figure out what is the best use of my time and what's most effective. I don't have a tried and true formula yet. Uh, I am working on that though. Uh, the book was definitely part of that, having that to kind of like get my thoughts down on paper for those who want to read about it. We have a lot of information on our website. Uh, so we're continuing to work with that, uh, particularly with my uh, CBD products. Um, and those are at cedameta.farm. Uh, we have our story there. And um, it's you kind of have this, maybe, maybe we're looking at two different groups of people. And this, this kind of occurs to any demographic or any product you sell. Some people like their primary, um, I guess you'd say values is price. And it has to be in a reasonable price point. And I'm not talking about the people who just buy the cheapest, but it got to be reasonably priced. And then the others, it's a little bit more important about where it was grown and how it was grown. And, you know, as you know, in the past, uh, there, there's, especially in the organic side of things, there was a premium price attached to that. And I think, you know, we're kind of coming a little bit closer now to what I'm going to call a fair price for good quality food. So not so much that you have a premium for it, but you'll, so we have this dynamic 
um, and it's in any business you have out there, how does that work out uh, with the, having a fair price and a good quality product and then getting your story out. And I'm telling you, it's not easy, uh, but I'm trying. I'm trying where I can. We're in the process of rebranding some of our uh, packaging for the farm uh, with our tomatoes and our squash and so forth in an effort to, to meet that goal. Um, one of the things about it is what I'm, what I'm not surprisingly seeing is some of my larger accounts uh, previously weren't interested in my story of just like, give me good stuff at a good price. Now it's like, hey, we wanna hear your story. We now have a social media director. You're planting, send pictures to us, send videos to us. That didn't happen five years ago. So um, that's just a good thing. I feel like I'm set up. I have a great track record. I'm not just a newcomer to this space. And so that's been helpful you know, for my specific situation. Uh, but you can't just say, hey, I'm a regenerative farmer. And then people just flock to you. You know, it doesn't work that way. Uh, so you have to gain some respect out there like you do in any other aspect of any other business. And that's kind of where I'm at on that side because I am ready now to be more aggressive in, in, um, in telling my story of the nutritional benefits of the way we grow things here. And, and I'll touch on a, a subject that is full of pitfalls is certification. Of course, oh. like before we have the, the meter to prove it, certifications are kind of the next step. It is a minefield of what those certifications are. What's your kind of two cents? What do you feel about that? <laughs> well, um, I'm, I'm somewhat neutral. I, I'm trying to decide, honestly, if, if I should, you know, maybe get certified by some of these, because in some ways it definitely is helpful. Um, if it starts getting very complex, I've been down one, for instance, that it got so complex. I'm not saying it wasn't good. It was just not for me. It was way too complex. And um, so uh, I think the certification is going to find its way. I think there should be some certification out there. Whether or not I'm going to dive fully into that yet, I'm not sure what we're certifying uh, because it's it's kind of, um, even organic certification is somewhat not as good as I think some people think it is, uh, you know, and I, I really, in, in my ideal world, I would like my reputation to carry its weight. This is my story. You're welcome to come to my farm. I have open books, so to speak. Um, and, and that to me is, is, is maybe more where I would lean naturally. Uh, that being said, I may be certified regenerative ag by somebody at some point. So I'm kind of waiting to see how that shapes and is being shaped. I'm aware of several. Uh, but you know, you kind of ask it in your question, if that meter does prove to be, you know, accurate enough and consistent enough to me, that's that's really uh that might be what I would intend to or be inclined to do. But we're probably a couple years away. So we really probably are uh, in that. So in the meantime, I'm gonna continue to base my sales, my story on its own merit and uh, see, see how that takes us. I, I think that's really great because in a lot of these conversations, we talk to people who believe in certification and that's great. But I also like point out like you can do it yourself with transparency. And mm -hmm. um, I'll ask you real quick. You said open farm tours. Do you guys do mm -hmm. lots of on-farm education? Kind of what kind of agritourism do you guys dip into? So um, over the last 25 years, I've had dozens and dozens of field days here, you know, from 30 people to 500 people here, depending on the event. Uh, last year, we did something very novel and unique. We had a hemp maze. We had a you know, field of hemp, four acres that we created design in and the people walked through it. That was really cool. I kind of decided that I don't want to go the agri entertainment route. That's just not what I'm set up for in my farm. My farm is just really not set up for it with parking and all that goes with that. So I don't, I don't see myself going the agri entertainment route. Um, but when I say my farm is open, if someone calls and said, hey, I'm in the area, I heard about your farm, I'd like to stop in. Yes. 
um, I'm open to that, provided it fits my schedule. So that's where that's at. That's where my transparency lies. So I've always had an open um, gate, if you want to put it that way. And uh, and, and I feel like you can come here and um, and see for yourself if it is what you hope it is. And uh, and that's that's kind of where I'm where I'm at right at the moment. I, I love that because agritourism is like its own beast, right? Yeah. Uh, between management of people along with trying to grow a crop. So while we we definitely encourage it, you know, as far as it's great to get people on farms, yeah. it's, it's not always about growing tomatoes. It's a lot about, you know, chasing kids and hoping somebody <laughs> doesn't get stuck in something. <laughs> You're so, right. <laughs> so I will uh, ask our last question. What does the future hold for you? What are you excited about for your farm? And what are what are kind of your big focuses? I think the future is bright um, because I am um, aware that more and more people are, I'll say, concerned about their health and well-being. And by growing in a regenerative way, we can provide that need. Um, on the hemp side of things, with the, the lotions, the, the tinctures that we have, it is just uh, uh, so gratifying to me that people have come up to me and said, their lives have been changed. They don't have migraine headaches anymore. Um, and and um, anxiety has been reduced. Sleep has in, increased. All those things by something I grew here in my farm. I mean, I do get compliments once in a while about the tomatoes and the squash, but rarely. Uh, it's kind of taken for granted. But with, with the whole hemp and the CBD part aspect of it, having those, I'll say, life-changing comments come in has been very gratifying. So we're going to continue to uh, expand that level of our business. And, and I feel like I am in position to uh, what I, I call it wind in our sails of the regenerative ag movement is becoming more and more uh, popular. Uh, I mean, just doing, just doing a interview like this, it would have never happened five years ago. So uh, here I am. I've been doing this for a long time. I did not imagine 25 years ago that I would be uh, at, at this point, that this would become this popular. I assumed I'd probably be, as someone had put it, an island of sustainability, you know, kind of forever. Uh, but here now, what I've been practicing and preaching is starting to gain momentum. And that's really encouraging to me. And, and I, I wanna be a, continue to be a part of the movement as we continue to learn because I like to tell people in five to 10 years from now, there'll be a few things that I'm doing now that I probably won't be doing anymore because we found a better way, a better method. And I think that's collectively true as well. So I'm optimistic about the future, the future of food, the future of farming. Uh, but as we all know, things are volatile in this world. And um, I am glad I'm a farmer these days because people have to eat um, in the context of you know, world volatility. But the challenges of labor um, is, is a very real thing. And uh, we do have our challenges. But I feel from the regenerative side of it, uh, when you're talking about you know, inputs and so forth going up in price, our inputs are, are not as high as conventional farmers. So I think, I think some of the challenges that are out there now can only make regenerative agriculture more popular. So I feel like I'm in the right spot to be. I love what I'm doing. I love where I'm at. And I, I look forward to the future. I love that. No better way to end it on. Thank you so much for being here and all your wisdom and for decades of hard work that led everybody else to the movement. <laughs> You're welcome. Thanks for letting me be a part of it.